From Hong Kong, Chicago and the city of Stoke-on-Trent, this is the Classic Lenses Podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 108. My name is Simon Forster and I'm joined by Johnny Sisson and Perry G. Hello, Johnny. Hello, all, and and, uh, happy Casimir Pulaski Day from Chicago. (laughs) What, 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 What does that mean? What do you mean, what does that mean? It's Casimir Pulaski Day in Chicago. Okay. I take it you guys don't know who Casimir Pulaski is. Nope. Well, Casimir Pulaski was the father of the American cavalry. So we got a holiday for him in Chicago because we got a lot of Polish people. So it's Pulaski <laughs> Day. So happy Pulaski Day, everybody! Yay. All right. It's the most Chicago day of the year. Eat some pierogies, drink some Malort. Yeah, well, the Bullard's not Polish, so you're probably going to have a beer and beat your wife after you have your... Oh, no, 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 no. (laughs) It's better than that damn Columbus Day we just had where the Italians got that uh, genocidal maniac that they celebrate. And nobody better take their day away. They're flipping out right now because... It's being changed to Indigenous Peoples Day in Illinois, and the Italians are freaking out that they took their day away because, you know, they couldn't have picked somebody else who maybe wasn't a genocidal maniac to have a day for. Unlike the Poles who have Pulaski Day, who is a fine, upstanding American patriot from the Revolutionary War, Simon. Yeah, well, uh, I'm I'm really sorry about all of that. Anyway, just, yeah. just, just, just think it it won't be long until uh, England and Wales are the 52nd and 53rd states of the union because we're going to let in the Puerto Ricans before we let you guys in, and then uh, and then you'll get to have Pulaski Day too. Well, we'll we'll, we'll look forward to that. And, yeah, uh, and. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking. Where do where do where do we go from there? Um, I know I should I should say something to Perry now. I guess so. Uh, Perry, rescue it. Hello. Uh, I don't think we're celebrating in anything in particular today on March second. <laughs> do you um, have any although, Polish national holidays in Hong uh, Kong? No. Although um, the cops busted out the tear gas all over the weekend for the first time in a couple of weeks. Uh, so maybe this whole coronavirus crisis is. Uh, so, so starting to slow down, and we're going back to some going form of back normality. To, going back know. to uh, tear gas season, huh? Yeah, yep. That's a sign of progress. Yeah, you could call it that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell tell us more about what's been going on in in your life this week, Perry. Uh, all right. Well, it's hard to follow that. That what was a Pulaski Day? Pulaski Day. It's hard to follow that, but uh, a couple of things. So, number one, uh, we actually will have a proper topic that we're going to discuss in depth a little bit later because last week when I discussed the Rodenstock Heligon lens, um, I went out on Shaw with it. it. It genuinely motivated me to shoot with the Sony. And, oh boy, the results from this lens are something else. The 3D pop is just out of this world. It's, it's, I mean, I knew it would be gorgeous because I've, I've shot it on film and I've seen images with it on digital before, but oh, it's something else. So after I posted those shots, a couple of people followed up by asking questions about um, how it's mounted onto a helicoid, what those helicoids are, where to get them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so when we're done updating on our weeks, I think we're going to do a nice little dive into a sort of how to a bit of a breakdown on the ins and outs of helicoid adapting. Cause you know, it does open up a whole, whole yeah. new world of lens adaptations that are in many ways more, um, it's, de- it's definitely a different approach than just purchasing an adapter from one mount to another, you know? So we'll discuss that later. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Part. So, Apart from that, which we will get to in a bit, um, yeah, I have been shooting with that lens. Uh, it's super nice. I shot some portraits at dinner. I went to a temple uh, locally called Manmo Temple, which is a really, really cool-looking temple to shoot in. And there's one time of year at a particular time of day where the sunlight pours through a hole in the roof and kind of illuminates all of the incense spirals on the ceiling. Um, I have yet to figure out what time of year or what time of day that is. 
uh, because it certainly was not when I went. But yeah, it was cool shooting. The surreal thing about shooting there was the streets were pretty much empty as I was walking towards the temple, you know, as is, as is normal now with this coronavirus, which you guys look like you'll be getting uh, pretty soon. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's it's just a, it's just a Democratic hoax. There's no such thing. <laughs> <laughs> not uh, gonna happen mike well, pence yeah. has got mike pence is at the helm nothing to worry about that's right you got god on your side so that's right yeah, yeah. um <laughs> but when, and when dinosaurs got... and dinosaurs who lived six thousand years ago because we don't believe in evolution <laughs> <laughs> no problem oh boy um Oh, my train of thought is just derailed. Oh, temple, temple. Yeah, so this temple was, um, the temple was totally packed full of people. And it was weird because I guess everyone was in the temple praying for the coronavirus to go away, um, which is not the best look because uh, the vast majority of cases recently in Hong Kong are linked to a different temple <laughs> in a, <laughs> another region. So I was like, eh. Mm, not sure how I feel about this strategy of a bunch of people gathering in one place praying for this extremely contagious virus to go away. But hey, um, but yeah, so I posted some shots with that lens. Um, I think I showed you guys, and it it looks really nice. What can yeah. I say? Roden stocky leg off. Um, but apart from that, the other thing I mentioned last week and during the show with Anil was, you know, I kept saying, "Oh, I wish there were a way for me to shoot." film the way I shoot my Ricoh GR2. And, well, lo and behold, as if on cue, a really well-priced uh, and mint condition Ricoh GR1, the film version, uh, popped onto the market here in Hong Kong because we're starting to see some really good deals pop up uh, as people are, I guess, dumping stuff during this coronavirus crisis as people's incomes are falling. So I picked one up. And I have been shooting with it pretty much nonstop since I got it. And, you know, I, I think I'm going to do a little, you know, segment in praise of point and shoots because you know, the lens on that camera is legendary, but the experience of shooting with it is just so liberating. There's just something about, you know, not having to think about any of the settings at all. But more importantly, I think it's not so much the settings as not having to have any steps between seeing the image I want to make and pressing the shutter button. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that was the most liberating part about shooting that way. So I, I blitzed through a couple of rolls so, so, so quickly. And it also let me shoot some images that I don't think I would have normally gotten. Um, ooh, is that coronavirus? Hopefully not. <laughs> not gonna, I'm not going to know. Not gonna wood. Um, no, every time someone coughs now in Hong Kong, it's like, ah, get away, run away. So, what was I talking about? Rico GR. There was one shot in particular of a wedding party that was walking down the street in a really sort of uh, relatively busy part of town in the middle of the day. And something had clearly gone horribly wrong with this wedding plan because <laughs> you had three bridesmaids, uh, one of whom was the flower girl or something. She was carrying a bouquet. They were all wearing masks and wearing purple and they were walking down the street and they all suddenly stopped. And in the, in between them, the bride and the groom uh, who were not wearing masks were standing there looking extremely annoyed. And the groom was, you know, talking intensely on his phone. So I literally ran across the street and just stood in front of them and framed and took a picture. And as soon as I took the shot, the, the bride looked away at the, bridesmaids all looked at me kind of disgusted <laughs> and I, I don't think i would have had both the time and just the wherewithal to, to run across the street and take that shot if it weren't with a point and shoot so ah, oh, that was so much fun guys that was really really liberating it was, it's a really good shot as well it's it's just really funny <laughs> thank you yeah it, it exactly it makes me laugh right because you look at it and you're like ooh, there's clearly something that's gone wrong here well, point and shoots are just awesome, though. I mean, it's it's yeah. it's as simple as that. And uh, I'm I'm a big fan of point and shoots, and I think that's um, one of the reasons why I want that uh, G2. Not that it's a point and shoot, but it actually can behave just like a point and shoot, except you can put fantastic lenses on it as well. So uh, I think that's what that's what appeals to me. But of course, um, I have been out using 
um, my other point and shoot, which is the uh, the amazing Agfa eFoto 780, <laughs> uh, with its interpolated 0.8 megapixel um, sensor, and uh, and <laughs> I, I took some. I was I was out with uh, Stig of the Dump um, on Twitter um, uh, at the start of the week, and um, just getting some. Uh, uh, weren't quite dawn shots, but uh, that that kind of thing at the seaside, and uh, and on the back of the the camera, it's got it has an LCD, um, so it is quite advanced, even though it's not it's even though it's manual focus digital camera point and shoot, so it's not entirely a point and shoot because you you have to do something with it, um, and the picture on the back of the screen actually looks amazing. I mean, <laughs> it was tiny, uh, but it looked it looked pretty good, um, and. Then I noticed a couple couple of things. Um, this this camera, uh, as I say, it's it's interpolated to 0 0.8 megabit, uh, megabyte uh, pixels, and but it's actually a 0 0.3 megapixel camera. And I realised that the first few photographs I'd taken, because I, I started playing around with the buttons, um, I wasn't actually shooting on its highest quality. <laughs> Well, you can you can turn it down. <laughs> it, was, it was in it was in low quality mode of uh, so uh, yeah. How 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 these zero point eight megapixels interpolated are going to come out on low quality? I really don't know. Um, but the other and and actually the reason why I don't know is because my computer won't accept the way that the smart media card that's in it <laughs> is formatted uh, because oh, it uses the FAT thirty two uh... system and Windows ten. Um, that's excellent. Doesn't like that. Um, at least I think that's what it says. So um, I've I've been told, well, just just run it through a Windows XP computer and you'll be fine. And well, there aren't many of those knocking around at the moment. So um, I'm, build your own. Well, there is always that, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just but, for that camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so I, I need I need to find either somebody with an XP computer or somebody that can uh, perhaps drop drop a line in the in the the Facebook group or uh, drop us an email uh, to classiclentispodcast at gmail dot com if you've got any tips on how to um, get well fat thirty two uh, files so I can actually read the things on the on the Windows ten computer or uh, sandboxing. Uh, Windows XP, if that's possible, or anything, anything like that. Any tips? You can do that on can, Mac wait, pretty easily. Can, can you? Uh, oh, it's not obviously not shooting raw, so no. I was just, no, I was, I was <laughs> yeah, just right, thinking, yeah. yeah, just drop it in a DNG converter. Yeah, no, I can't. I just, uh, I physically cannot get the files off the, off there. Right. Um, it says you must yeah. format the card first. Well, no, I can't do that. I've got amazing photographs on there. It, it's uh, you know fifty two kilobytes or whatever they are. Um, so, so, so no, no, can't, can't do that. So, uh, yeah, any, any tips will be gratefully received, but yeah, you just mentioned there, Perry, that you can put XP on, onto a Mac. I've seen that done. Uh, I don't know if that can be done onto, on a windows computer. I suppose it could be, but any, like I say, any, any tips gratefully received and they, including if they say, well, just, just put it, put Linux on your computer or something like that. I, I can, I can do that if that helps. Um, so, uh, so yeah, help will be, uh, uh, gratefully received there. So uh, sorry about that. All right. <laughs> oh, that's that's twice twice in a row now. Two weeks in a row where I've tried to talk about a Rico GR and you've somehow segued into the Ag for Epo. <laughs> it's it's seven eighty. It's well, the G the, well, they they're just spiritual uh, brothers, aren't they? Really? Let's let's face it. They're just almost <laughs> the same camera. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, Chi Chin Chong. Um, all right. No, Rico GR. So point and shoots. As you were you were just saying that they're really fun to shoot and. You know, a lot of the time the issue is the lens because the only other point and shoot I really used was this Nikon 310 AF um, lens that I've had since I was a uh, camera since I've had camera that I've had since I was a kid. Um, but that lens is not good. It's like a 35 to 70, I think, uh, slow zoom. And a lot of the point and shoots out there that have really good lenses in them, you know, they're they're starting to get a little crazy expensive. Um, so the only other one I have is a Leica Mini Lux, but someone gave that to me as a gift. It's it's new in box, so I haven't taken it out yet to actually shoot. Although I'm starting to think that the Mini Lux and the Ricoh GR will be a really nice combo with a 28 and 40, a 28 to 8 and a 42.4. Um, although the problem with that Mini Lux is the viewfinder sucks. 
it, it's really small. So anyway, yeah, Ricoh GR, wonderful camera. It's uh, I've wanted one for a long time. It's super light. It feels like it's going to break at any moment. Um, but nice finder, exposes well. The lens is great. And it's, you know, it, it, with point and shoots, I'm always a little worried about shutter lag. But I was taking some photos of this little girl um, skipping, like jump, doing jump rope in the uh, setting sun. And with some really long shadows being cast. And and there were quite a few of the shots where, you know, the moment I pressed the shutter is when the shutter went off and there wasn't any real delay for autofocus or anything like that. So there's a couple of shots where she's like midair with her shadow um, hanging in front of her. And I'm really, really happy with how those turned out. And again, it would have been a little trickier to shoot those with anything else. Again, they, that's that was a pretty spectacular shot. Um, I think with, yeah. Yeah, there were two of them. I think there were two of them, weren't there? Yeah, but uh, but yeah, yeah. Shots. Ah, thank you. I really struggled um, to choose between them because the first one I posted, she is smaller in the frame, but the shadow is more prominent, and it's more obvious that she's skipping because you can see the uh, outline and shadow of the rope. And then the second one, the rope is kind of blurred out by motion blur, but she's more prominent, and there's kind of like a dual shadow um, being cast in two different directions. And I, I like them both equally, and I couldn't decide between them. So normally it'd be like, you know, when you got two similar pictures, you pick the best one of the set. But here I, I really could not choose between them. So post them both. Nice. Yeah, good yeah. chats. Cool. So you guys, uh, a little pause there. You guys have nothing to say about point and shoots. I think I would have said mine. I can talk about my Agfa again. <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> That's what I was waiting for. I was just <laughs> assuming you were coming back with something on the Agfa. <laughs> yeah, no. I think I think we're done on that. Shall we move on? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, there is there is only one more thing I want to say about the Ricoh GR one before we move on. Um, it does this thing with the film that the only other camera I have that does this is the X Pan, where when you load the film, it unwinds all of it. And it counts backwards. So after you take a picture, yeah. the frame goes back into the canister. The reasoning behind that is if something happens or if there's a light leak or you accidentally open the back of the camera, at least all of the photos that you've shot um, are okay. And it's just the unexposed film that gets destroyed. And in principle, I guess I think I like this approach better. Although in practice, it usually doesn't make a difference. Or you kind of feel bad if you lose an entire roll of film. Yeah. Uh, apart from that, I haven't been up to that much other than shooting. Um, I have a couple of lenses that have arrived, but I haven't actually tried them very much. The one that I have tried the most is the, uh, well, the three that arrived, not this week, but within the last month during the coronavirus uh, delays, are a Voigtlander 28 millimeter uh, f3.5 color Scopar, the LTM version. Uh, Black, of course. Um, And the other two are a Canon 25mm f3.5 and a Voigtlander 50mm f2 Heliar uh, collapsible lens. So these three lenses, um, I've shot with a Scopar the most. I've used it a bunch of times. It's super nice, super compact, handles well. Um, 39mm filter thread. I don't know. Do Do you guys have anything about this lens you want to talk about? I don't have one, so no, per, nothing, per, nothing, per, nothing personal. All right, it's a good lens. Um, and other than that, the twenty-five three point five Canon is a very weird lens. Uh, it's a topogon design um, with an extra flat element at the back, which is there for no apparent reason. Um, <laughs> so that's actually been really fun to shoot with because it is tiny. It's like. It's maybe a one one centimeter, just over one centimeter long. So when I stick it on a Barnack or stick it on my Canon uh, 5L2, it basically disappears into the camera. Um, although the viewfinder is massive, the external finder that it came with. So yeah, I've been playing around with that lens on digital and on film, and it's it's got a lot of character for a wide angle lens. You know, it's it's plenty sharp in the middle, but it falls off quite dramatically on the edges in a very vintage looking way. And then when there's highlights in the frame, um, I shot some pictures with it on my Sony in the temple. When there's highlights in the frame, they do that glowy thing that a lot of old vintage lenses do. 
So it, it looks kind of cool. I don't think I have another, you know, wide angle lens with this much character or that is this flawed. I think that's just the Topagon design. It's not a particularly yeah. uh, modern or well-corrected uh, lens design. That very much makes sense. Yeah. And that's it. Uh, I got the Heliar, but I haven't used it yet. I know Mike Epstein here also got the same lens, the Heliar, and he's used it a lot more than I have. So I will report back when I have had some time. Okay. That is it. Very good. Yeah. So should we head to Chicago? Okay. <clears throat> Where, as you know, it is Pulaski Day today. Oh yeah, we're just here in Chicago drinking, drinking uh, ginger juice, celebrating Pulaski Day. Pierogies in the oven. Not yet. They will be later. All right. So how's everybody? What's going on? So have you been up to nothing, Johnny? <laughs> oh no, no, I've been up to stuff. Is that what we were talking about? Um, yeah. So uh, I well, my big news of the of of this week is I uh, I finally reskinned my. Um, Roly uh, 35 RF, which had, uh, I believe I've talked about, had the uh, the grips kind of fell off. So it needed reskinning. So I, I, I bought, uh, I bought leathers for the uh, Bessa R2, which is essentially the same camera, but the grip, um, the grip areas are different. So I had to mm-hmm. kind of custom cut the leather that I got to fit on the rolly. Um, so I used the um, cellophane tape trick where essentially you build up several layers of cellophane tape and you kind of cut a template. Uh, and I did that and it worked really well. It, it looks not horrible. I mean, it, you know, it fits now and I got it to kind of like fit all the little nooks and crannies pretty well. Cause there's a couple of really weird little, spots where there's odd cuts but anyway i got it in a vid so that's that's the good news so that kind of puts my um 40 millimeter stuff back in play um so i'll be back out with the 40 millimeter again which i had kind of been on hold with until i could get the camera reskin so that is my big accomplishment of the week yeah it looked pretty good yeah thanks thanks um maybe see a little bit of it today we'll see so that's it. That's my big excitement photo news for the week. Simon, how are things in Stoke? Hello, Simon. Simon, I think he's, I think he's dropped off. Uh, La- there's the La- message. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, I. I believe Simon has left the building. So, uh, oh, I think they have AT and T in or, Stoke on Trent. Or the internet has left Simon's building. So we're gonna. I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna go on. We have a topic. I think we'll just kind of continue with that then, Perry. Uh, that yeah, that, that's what Simon is messaging on his phone. So, okay, uh, we're not gonna hear about what's happening in Stoke on Trent today. Uh, but we do have a discussion based on the the thing that I hinted earlier in the show. Um, in terms of mounting lenses onto helicoids. So a couple things here. I think the best way for us to do this is I'll do a quick breakdown of the sort of overall concept. Cause Johnny, I know you've done this a bunch with Kodak vest pocket cameras, right? Yeah, I've done it. I, I've done it. Yeah. A bunch with that lens in particular was one of the first ones I did. Cause it's just so easy, but then I've done a bunch of others and I have a, a bunch of examples here in front of me that I can talk about as well. So, okay, great. Yeah. So the questions we got last week after I posted some stuff from this road and stock were essentially about uh, how to mount lenses onto helicoids, what helicoids are, how to get them, um, and so on and so forth. So we're going to do a little bit of a breakdown. Um, the, the kinds of lenses that you would do this on are basically the kinds of lenses that you can't find you know, a ready-made adapter for. So we're talking about things like projection lenses uh, and larger lenses. And in particular, lenses taken off fixed lens cameras, uh, whether they're folding medium format cameras or things like the uh, Kodak Retina that I got the Rodenstock Heligon off. So, you know, these lenses, obviously, they don't have a mount because they're fixed to the camera. So if you want to adapt them to digital uh, or adapt them onto another 
mechanism essentially you got to find a way to get it onto that body and you have to find a way to focus it which is essentially moving the lens back and forth uh there may be other considerations like uh usually the aperture control will be in the lens so you'll be okay um and occasionally you may have to deal with issues like shutters built into the lens but yeah. backing up backing up for a second so the basic concept is there are uh three steps to this you need a helicoid which is a basically like an extension tube type thing that has a focusing mechanism in it. So it'll move the lens back and forth and you'll use that to focus. So your three steps are number one, uh, once you've ripped the lens off of the camera, you have to get the lens onto the helicoid and then you have to uh, get the right size helicoid as step two. And uh, then step three is getting the helicoid onto the camera. Right. Um, and before we break down how to do this, I do want to put a plea out there, and that's don't go around destroying perfectly good functional cameras. Um, <laughs> the the best kind of project camera for this is one where the body is trashed. So, you know, fungused up viewfinders or desilvered uh, mirrors, um, things like that, where the lens is good, but everything else in the camera doesn't work or is just in terrible condition. See, now you so, say that, Perry, but... Sitting in front of me, one of the lenses that I have sitting in front of me uh, is a Kodak uh, Ektar 45 millimeter f2, uh, which I ripped off a perfectly functional Bantam special. That's fair. <laughs> there yeah, are definitely because I can't stand that camera, and this lens deserves to be liberated and used on something more useful. Yeah, yeah, there, there are exceptions. There are definitely some lenses that are so nice uh, that it's a shame to use them on the cameras they originally came on. I mean, I, I think the, the Kodak Retina folding uh, 35 millimeter rangefinder is one of them. Yeah. Um, there's also lenses like the Aries Coral lens off the uh, Aries 35. Oh yeah. Which is those super, are, those are nice. Yeah. Super nice lens. Um, very hard to find a camera that is not in trash condition. Uh, and even if you do, they're not the best to use anyway. So yeah, there, there are definitely exceptions to that rule. Yeah. Um, but, you know, don't don't go taking nice lenses off nice cameras just just for the sake of this, because you can find this. The beauty of this, too, is you can find on eBay dead cameras with good lenses and and they're. Yeah, they're for sure. Them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Sorry. Go on. Oh, no, that's all. I was just disagreeing. That's a good it's a good plan. I, I And I, I found tons of these things like at uh, camera fairs camera shows where there's mm -hmm. just either dead cameras or lenses already removed from cameras. I've gotten a lot of, a lot of things at places like that. Um, uh, I've got another lens I have in front of me is off of a Foth Derby, which is an, a very interesting oh. camera, but it's really hard to find a working one. So I, I think I have, I do actually have a working one, but I had about like three of them that weren't working. So I, I pulled the lenses off of those. Um, yeah. Anyway, oh. Plenty of raw materials out there. Yeah. Okay. So step one. Um, I, actually, why don't we start with the helicoids? Because that's the important part that you need to get. And this is where most of the uh, questions came. Yeah. Um, in terms of the helicoids, there are a couple of things to consider. Uh, specifically size, quality, um, whether or not you're going to have multiple helicoids or you're going to use extension tubes, uh, as well as things like brands and where to buy. So let's start with helicoid size. Johnny, I think you have a lot more experience with this than I do, but you can get helicoids in a lot of different sizes, and you kind of have to make sure that the helicoid distance plus any tubes you add is essentially the flange distance of the lens on the original camera. Yeah, right, right. Um, which I I actually uh, don't try to match the helicoid si size to the, to the flange distance. I... I um, I tend to use the uh, smaller helicoids that don't have a ton of travel, but you don't really need them to have a mile worth of travel anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, most even, even a even a short helicoid will give you focus once you have the register distance set up. It'll d typically give you focus from infinity to sometimes a few inches. Mm -hmm. So e even a short helicoid is more than adequate for doing that with the vast majority of lenses. Um, yeah. yeah. So I tend to pick the most compact and well-made helicoids I can get. And then I use tubes to 
build the lens out to the correct register distance, right? Um, that makes sense because yeah. you know if you have a helicoid that's too long, then you're not going to get infinity. Right. Um, whereas if right. the helicoid is too short, then you can always add distance to it with extension tubes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, in terms of these helicoids, would I be correct in saying that the vast majority of them are M42 on both ends? Uh, the ones I use are, I know some people use yeah. the bigger uh, M52, right? Yeah. Um, I have one of those for lenses. Pattern. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, but I mean, most most lenses will fit in a M42 helicoid. Um, so yeah, it's got an M42 opening on the front and then M42 threads on the back. Yeah, and it basically looks like a black adapter with a ring uh, right. in the middle that you turn. So if you're looking on eBay or looking on uh, at these in, in the shop, um, that's the kind of thing that you're looking for. Yeah. Now, the quality of the helicoid that you choose... Uh, will have an enormous impact on the quality of your experience as well. Right. Um, so the ones that I have are all branded uh, Yifeng, or they're unbranded, but I think those are essentially copies of the Yinons. Yeah. Um, I'm not really sure what's out there, in, but but I have felt some really, really bad helicoids before. So yeah. uh, do you know more about the, you know, the brands I, that make them? Well, I mean, I, I've just personally did a lot of trial and error um when i was making these things by you know i was making when i was doing a lot of adapting i went through a lot of helicoids um and i mean that the conclusion i came to was basically to avoid the cheap ones because they work for a little while and then inevitably they they get really loose or they're just you know the quality is just garbage and i didn't mm-hmm. want to work with them anymore so i kind of ended up with uh the ones that I have as my go-to are the vintage um, Pentax ones, which are marked either variable close-up tube or um, helicoid extension tube, I believe. Uh, they're they're marked a couple different ways, but they're the same. So those are, to me, that's like the gold standard of helicoids because they, they move the way Pentax lenses move, which is mm. to say very smooth. And yeah. they're really well made, so they're solid. They don't loosen up. I mean, they're just they're super well made. And uh, the other one that I get is the Yanon version, which is essentially a copy of this Pentax version. So to me, those are the the only ones that I use anymore, just because they're they're really well made. Um, the uh, the Pentax, the vintage Pentax ones, um, they used to be really cheap, and now I think they've gotten really expensive. Uh, so those can be a little pricey. Uh, and the, uh, Yinan ones are kind of like, they're, they're more expensive than the knockoff ones, but you're absolutely getting what you pay for. So, you know, they're a little more expensive, but I would say they're worth it because in the end you really probably only need one or two helicoids. Um, you, it's not like you need a dozen of them. So, well, it depends how you do it, but, but I mean, at least the way I'm going to talk about doing it, you really don't need more than one or two because you're making the lens that goes in front of the helicoid. You're making that essentially interchangeable. Right. Um, which I'll talk about in a minute. But so to me, that's my approach, I guess is, is just go get a good helicoid and then um, you'll, I think you'll appreciate in the end that you spent a little bit uh, of extra upfront. Yeah, and and when we say they cost a little bit more, we're we're not talking huge amounts of money. No, no, they're not they're not crazy expensive. I haven't looked. Um, I could find out real quick. Um, yeah, well, while you're looking that up, I mean, as, yeah, as the owner of both really nice and really crap helicoids, um, <laughs> the, the ones that are really crap will either fall apart uh, or they just don't feel good to use. And yeah. if you have a really nice helicoid. It, it, it feels like a, you know, almost like a new lens when you mount it. Yeah. And that really does transform the experience. Like on this, this retina, uh, Rodenstock retina helicon that I have, the helicoid I've got it mounted on is super, super nice. So even though the focusing mechanism in this lens is still intact and still very, very smooth, um, I far prefer to focus with the helicoid. And that's yeah. really the hallmark of a good helicoid, where you would rather use the helicoid to focus than any focusing mechanism that's still residual within the lens. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I do the same thing because a lot of times the um, lens, even if it has a helicoid, there's a, there's a good likelihood that the, uh, the threads on that helicoid on the lens might not be, you know, smooth and Mm -hmm. working well anyway. So you'd have to probably totally overhaul the lens to, to get it working hundred percent. And a lot of times, you know, they don't have that much travel anyway, or sometimes the mechanism for how those lenses um, work, especially if they came off of like, uh, well, a a lot of cameras just don't have the helicoid built in at all. So Mm. even if you find one with a helicoid um, and actually the Foth lens is a good example of that. It has a focus tab uh, just like, um, a Leica lens will, or any other sort of M42 lens. It has a little, you know, it has a, a tab for focusing, which can be helpful, but it's, you know, it, a helicoid is a much uh, more pleasant experience. And then the other thing it, you have is if you get a helicoid and you get the infinity worked out based on, um, you know, the register distance plus the helicoid in your adapter, then you've, then you can always use the threads on the lens to give you like extra macro focusing capability. Right. right. Yeah. Right. But it's not like you're relying on those, uh, that the lens helicoid the whole time. Um, so makes things a little bit easier. So yeah. uh, just, just real quick. So I'm looking at, um, let's see an M42 to M42. They must have one here. Um, but it looks like they run about, Oh, here we go. M42 to M42. You know, on helicoid extension tube, which is an exact copy <laughs> of the uh, Pentax one that we've um, been talking about. It even uses the same writing on the tube face, which says helicoid extension tube. Um, it's sixty-one dollars. Mm-hmm. So, versus, I would say twenty dollars for the cheap knockoff ones, or maybe less. Yeah, and, and if you get a chance to feel them in person. Um, the cheap ones tend to feel a little scratchy in their their movement when you turn the focus, or yeah. they're not really well lubricated. Whereas the really nice ones can feel as nice as like an SMC Takumar. Yeah, right. and that's really what you're looking for because it it's just a much more satisfying experience. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so yeah, there you go. Where can you get them in the states? Um, because I'm a big proponent of going to a shop that carries them and bringing the lens you want to adapt and then just making I, the build in the shop. I, oh, no, that would not happen here. Okay, well, <laughs> no, if, that, that's not a USA thing for sure. Um, I mean, you, you, I suppose you could bring the, if you had the bits and pieces, you could probably find a repair place that would assemble it all, but there's... That's not there's, necessary. Yeah, there's not going to be a shop you can walk into that will, number one, have helicoids. I, I, I doubt almost any shop is going to have those. So you, to me, you really need to buy them, you know, probably on eBay or Amazon or something. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, um, if you are in Hong Kong, then yeah. um, I can highly recommend a shop that I love. It's called little garden and it's based in the uh, Guntong. And basically it is run by these two lovely ladies And they not only carry helicoids and everything else you'll need um, in various sizes, but they can help you just put together your build. If you tell them, here's this lens and I want to put it on this, Um, they they can make magic happen. You know, so this is child's play to them. You know, if you give them a weird lens, they can get it onto an Instax for you if you want. Wow, that's super cool. Yeah, they're awesome. They they sell all of these, uh, these parts and adapters and things like that, but they'll also just service and build these things for you so if you're in hong kong and you've got some weird lenses uh, i know at least one of our listeners has i think a dead lens from an olympus trip that he wants to try um then just head on over to little garden and they can they can hook you up with everything that you need tell them i sent you as well and they might give you a discount (sighs) i can't i can't promise that (laughs) (laughs) oh that's that's awesome um Okay, so that is the helicoid itself. That's obviously quite important. Right. The next part, the next big step is getting the lens onto the helicoid. Right, right. Uh, and this is the big one. I think this is the one where you've got loads and loads of experience um, because the way that I've done it, there are three things that I've done which are different from the way that you do it. Mm-hmm. So because the front of the helicoid is M42, you basically have to get the back of the lens uh, to have an m42 ring on it 
The three ways that I do it are, number one, you can either purchase a thread adapter. So these are basically the same sort of concept as a step-up ring. Um, if your lens has a screw-in thread at the back, and not all of them do, but most lenses from folding cameras that have a retaining ring to hold the lens in place uh, will have them. But basically, if there's a screw, then you need to know how big that screw is on the back of your lens. Um, and then you get an uh, you get an adapter ring for that size to M42. And so that way, you just screw your lens into this little ring, and then you screw the little ring into the front of the M42 helicoid, or M52 if that's the size you've got, uh, and bingo, your lens is on the helicoid. Um, I guess the other step we need to talk about when I'm done here is getting the lens off the camera, but, but anyway. <laughs> Apart from the thread adapter, the other two methods I've used uh, are using a clamp ring, which is essentially, if your lens doesn't have a uh, screw thread on the back, um, it's basically a metal ring with three grub screws in it that you would then use the friction of the grub screws to hold in place on mm -hmm. the back of your lens. So you can then screw that into uh, M42. So it would be, you know, an M42 uh, ring with grub screws. So, yeah, that's called a clamp ring. And uh, if all else fails, the third method uh, that I have used uh, is tape. Which is the ghetto, <laughs> right? Been there, been there too, Perry. <laughs> and I've done the clamp thing. Um, you know where it tends to work really well is with projector lenses that have no kind of, uh, you know, retaining ring on them or anything. They're just basically yeah. meant to slide into a tube. Um, so I've I've used that method to hold, uh, yeah, to to basically to do um, projector lenses tends to be the easiest way to do it. And I've used tape for that too, like as a shim and as a way to fix the lens on. Um, mm -hmm. Some people also do hot glue. Um, yeah, which I've done, but I find that it just doesn't really want to stick to metal. So uh -huh. it, kind of, it kind of, it's a not a permanent solution, um, kind of a temporary solution. But some people do that too. Yeah, and you're, you're going to, you, you, you risk, you know, making your lens permanently ugly if you're gluing stuff to it. Yeah, 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 right. I mean, the, the glue seems like it just wants to peel off, but, you know. But you you have a different method that you use, um, at least for these vest pocket Kodak lenses, right? Uh, yeah, I actually use this method for most of the things that I adapt because I tend to mostly adapt lenses that have a retaining ring on the back, um, and that mm -hmm. makes this method... Um, particularly easy. Uh, I'm just like looking at, I, I've got, I have four lenses in front of me that I've all adapted this way. So basically what I, uh, what I do is I, I take the, uh, the lens, um, uh, and the, the lens on the camera that it came off of, if it's a bellows folding camera, which most of the ones that I have are, um, then the way that lens was attached to the bellows on the camera was that there's essentially a little lens board on the camera, right? And the, mm -hmm. that, that little lens board has a hole in it for the lens. And then that retaining ring is the ring that sort of, uh, or some people call it a jam nut. Um, it, it just clamps between the, the, it clamps the lens to the lens board on the folding camera. And basically what I do is I, I take that same method and just use it as part of the, uh, the adaptation. So what I do is I take, a body cap, uh, an M42 body cap. So it's a, a body cap for an M42 camera. So it's threaded on the backside and it's a, just a, you know, blank piece of, uh, in my case, usually metal or plastic on the front side. Um, so what I do is I just, I use a hole saw and I cut, uh, so a hole saw is basically a, a drill bit um, that makes holes. <laughs> it's, okay. it's intended, it's intended for that purpose. It's like, you know, think it's a, it's basically a saw, but it's round if that uh -huh. makes sense. And you put yeah. it on a, you put it on a drill, right? And now you've got basically a, a, a round saw. So it makes a round hole in whatever you want to make a round hole in. And what I make that hole in is a lens cap. Um, so I make a hole and then I take the lens and I, I clamp it onto that lens cap, just the way you, it would be clamped onto, um, a lens board. That's essentially what you're making is a lens board out of a lens cap. 
Sorry, you mean cap. a body cap, right? Yeah. And so okay. then the, the then the body cap could either screw directly onto the helicoid or more than likely to get the spacing correct, to get the flange distance correct, I'll use um, M42 extension tubes. So I'll put mm-hmm. that lens and uh, l- that lens and body cap together onto an extension tube of the appropriate length to position the lens the correct distance from the film or sensor, right? So right. Uh, extension tubes are all it is. Uh, it's basically a um, a piece of tube with threads on each end. So it has uh, threads on the back and an opening on the front, both M42. And it's going to be a particular uh, length. Um, and they tend to come in three sizes, sort of small, medium, and large, right? But mm-hmm. um, if you find older ones, they have – slightly different sizes. Like I found that really short extension tubes often work really well. And the shortest extension tube uh, for M42 generally is about 10 or 12 millimeters. Mm -hmm. Um, But you can find much narrower ones like five or six millimeters. And then you can even find a lot of times a, um, a simple ring, which is maybe a millimeter thick, which you can use as a spacer to really kind of fine tune the distance. And I've used those quite a bit. So um, extension, extension tube sets for M42 are extremely helpful for building this kind of adaptation. And you can find those like dirt cheap online. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And and like I said, the uh, you know, look for the older ones, which um, sometimes the shorter tubes are less than 10 or 12 millimeters. Those are really, really helpful. Uh, so anyway, those are sort of the bits and pieces that I, that I use. I have a diagram of this that we can share in the notes, um, that kind of shows each piece, uh, each piece of the, uh, of the extension build or the, of the uh, adapter build. So you're, Uh, you're basically just using, um, the retaining ring from the lens yeah. That holds it onto its original camera to then hold it onto this body cap. Yeah. I'm using the, I'm using the lens exactly as it was sort of intended to function in terms of mm-hmm. um you know being attached to a camera i'm using the same method uh that it would have been used you know attached to the camera it came off of i'm just putting it on a different lens board which is essentially what the body cap with the hole in it is gotcha yeah right okay cool so that's getting the lens onto the helicoid right yep. um is there anything else I think we've pretty much covered everything on this step, right? Um, yeah, I think so. Okay, uh, so you've got your lens onto the helicoid. You've got your helicoid plus tubes or whatever size helicoid. Um, and the last step is just getting it onto your camera. Yeah, so you just, you'll just you need an adapter um, that goes from M42 or M52, depending on what helicoid you're using, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so you basically need an M42 adapter to whatever camera body type that you're adapting to i think you mean Um, to sony yeah right (laughs) (laughs) yeah just get that adapter uh for your sony and you're all set but Uh, but, but hold on so it's important to clarify here i think that um what you probably want is an m42 to uh sony or fuji or nikon or whatever whatever um, yeah a a ring and not not an adapter um because the adapter will have the exact flange distance uh, for M42, you know, SLR lenses. But right, the, but, the, but I, yeah, but sometimes it de- it depends. Um, it depends because a lot of times these lenses from folding cameras sat, sit much farther from uh, the sensor on a mirrorless camera. So you're probably going to need to build that space up anyway. So for instance, yeah. So for instance, like I have an, if I have an M42 to Fuji X adapter, that lens is still going to sit far enough away from the sensor that I'm going to need a helicoid. And then I'm going to need the spacer right between the helicoid and the, and the lens to get the, the distance correct. Right. So, Yeah. So with mirrorless, I actually start with just a standard, like let's say Fuji X to M42, or it could be a Sony to M42, or it could be a four thirds to M42 adapter, which is the correct flange distance, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Now there are lenses that 
don't need that much extension. And for those, you can get uh, just a short, it's just basically a short, uh, very short adapter that's yeah. not set to M42 flange distance. It's just M42 thread, right? Yes, so that, those that's conversion thin, rings. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I have a lot of those too, and I also use those for adapting, depending on how far the lens needs to sit from either the sensor right. or the film plane. So, so your if, mileage is going to vary depending. Yeah. Yeah. Like the Rodenstock Helagon that I've got in front of me, it would not um, work with an M42 to Sony like traditional adapter yeah. um, because it sits really close to the film plane. And so the entire build behind the lens is maybe like two centimeters. So, but I guess if your lens is long enough, then what you're saying is just using the M42 adapter as part of the build as, as almost like an extension tube essentially. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Whereas if you don't need that extra space, then what you want is a uh, M42 to Sony or whatever, um, just a conversion ring. It's like a millimeter thick M42 on the front or M52 and then Sony on the back or Fuji on the back. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So yeah. that's, that's pretty much, uh, that's pretty much it. Right. So the entire build looks like lens on the front. Um, yeah. and then attach the helicoid and then you got your helicoid. Um, do you put your extension tubes in front of or behind the helicoid? Uh, generally in front of the helicoid. Cause that, because, so the way I kind of think about this, the way I've always thought about it is that I want my adapted lenses to be like basically interchangeable. So let's mm -hmm. say I had like two or three adapted lenses with me. Uh, they all have helicoid. They all have extension tubes built into the part that goes in front of the helicoid. So in other words, what I could do is if I, once I've fine tuned in the correct distance for each lens, I could then just pop any of those lenses on the camera I'm using and the extension is, you know, the distance is going to be correct. Gotcha. That makes sense. Right. That totally makes yeah. Sense. So, it, it, so basically what you're doing is you're building, you're making whatever lens you're adapting, you're making it interchangeable. Mm-hmm right to the lens mount to the to the focusing portion of your adaptation <laughs> yep 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 that that totally makes sense yeah. um and so that that way yeah so i guess in in that case um you just have when you're stacking your extension tubes you're just also taking into account whether or not you're using a full size m42 adapter or just a ring at the back yeah exactly yeah, and so when you detach your lenses, they have the extension tubes attached to them already. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, okay. I, so, so, like I have in front of me, I have one extension tube, or I'm sorry, one helicoid, and then I have four lenses. Each one is mounted into uh, an M42 body cap, mm -hmm. and then behind that, each one has a little bit of extension tube to make the lens the right distance. So, for other, in other words, if I was to put any of these on my Fuji camera right now. I could use the same uh, helicoid um, and plus mount adapter and just put these lenses on and they would all focus to infinity because I've kind of pre I've pre built them to focus to infinity um, in front of the helicoid. Right. Gotcha. So that that attaches as a unit. Um, and again, the idea behind that was I, I want my adapted lenses to be like any other interchangeable lens, uh, you know, so I don't have to like build one unit of, uh, you know, helicoid and, and adapter, right? And in other words, I, do, I wouldn't need like 20 helicoid and adapter combos, one for each lens that I yeah. might be, right? So I can just have the one uh, helicoid and mount any lens onto it essentially uh, to go onto the camera once you've built it out to the right flange distance. Okay, and, and I guess the other important thing to say here is that you don't have to be a hundred percent precise because no. as long as you're hit, as long as you're hitting infinity, you know, chances are you're going to go past infinity as well, but that's totally right. Fine. Yeah. And that's how I do it too, is as long as yeah. I can get to infinity and beyond, I'm fine. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, because you, you're, you know, if you can hit infinity, the helicoid almost always is going to give you infinity on one end and like super macro focusing on the other. Yeah. Even exactly. with the So, yeah. So yeah, because it's not like it's not like you're um, gonna scale focus this thing. You're using it on a digital camera with p focus peaking or zoom in ability. Right? Yeah. You, typically, you're not. I mean, you you could you could you could do it that way, but typically you're focusing, you know, uh, precisely. 
Will this work on an M42 film camera? Sure. Yeah, as long as yeah. yeah. No, as long as you get the distance right, it'll work fine. Yeah. Um, as long as as long as that's the key is you, it's getting everything to 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 focus correctly to infinity on whatever uh, camera that you're using, whether that be film or digital, right? Um, assuming that you want infinity focus. I mean, there are people who a- adapt things only for a closer up shooting. Mm-hmm. Um, Macro shots. Yeah, but I, I always want to do mine so that they'll focus to infinity. Yeah. Um, just so I have like the full range of usefulness of that particular lens. Um, yeah. Uh, but that yeah, makes, that makes it, sense. Yeah. Cause, but they'll, cause they'll, they'll focus to and anything you correctly space them for. I've seen people use um, lots of weird old large format lenses uh, adapted mm-hmm. to Pentax 6.7 using this method. Oh yeah, sure. I, I've and I've I've sort of done that as well, and it it works. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, it works particularly well on SLRs because you know you can see where the point of focus is, which you can't yeah. do in a rangefinder. No, it, um, it won't work on a rangefinder. <laughs> yeah, although I have I've done this on rangefinders. Um, uh, I one of my first adaptations on a rangefinder, and I have it over here in front of me, is putting the uh, oh here it is right here. Um, I have uh, the lens from the Vivitar Ultra Wide and Slim oh, adapted, yeah. adapted to uh, LTM. So it's mm-hmm. basically a fixed focus point and shoot lens on like a Barnack body. So I have in front of me a Tower 3, which is a Leica clone um, with a Vivitar Ultra Wide and Slim lens on it, which basically makes it a super it's like having it's like one step above having a pinhole uh body cap on it it's that thin um that's the key right it, if you're gonna do this on a rangefinder, um you're gonna have to use depth of field and for, yeah yes, right the so, focus yeah so like i tuned in when i did this adaptation because i mean the ultra wide and slim is a, a fixed focus point and shoot camera anyway mm-hmm. so so the lens has i think it's like an f uh 12 right uh, Right. essentially lens um so it, it i mean it that's how it works anyway right so what i do is i i i just tune in the um the point of focus to be at about 12 feet about three meters um and then that gives me plenty of depth of field for street shooting so that my foreground let's say i have people walking by and they're three meters away two meters away even a meter away they're going to be acceptably in focus and then I'm still going to have it focused pretty much to infinity. So mm. yeah, you just kind of tune it in for the point of focus that you want as your preferred distance. You could just as easily also set that for infinity if you wanted to. Uh, but I tend to, yeah, but I tend to set it for like a hyperfocal, um, and then I shoot it that way. Yeah. Cause so, I mean, you're, you're not going to get rangefinder coupling for, cause for that you need to pay someone a, yeah, lot of money, that, a lot of money to do it well. Right. That would be a whole different operation. So yeah, yeah no, no range finder coupling. Um, I've just built them as purely, um, you know, fixed focus scale yeah. focus. Yeah. And you know, if there's anyone listening who, um, is keen to try this out, but doesn't have access to, uh, easy access to all the parts and, you know, for some reason you don't want to buy them on eBay. Um, there, there are a lot of different ways to build these because the general principle is always the same, right? It's just, right. you need a helicoid to focus and then you need the distance roughly correct. So for example, I know a lot of people out there will have like the Yinon or Voigtlander VME adapter, the Leica M to Sony E adapter, uh, which is a very, very nice helicoid, right? Have, yeah. So right. theoretically, if you got a set of extension tubes um, that were M42 to Leica M, at the very end, you could do you could use that as your helicoid, right? Yeah. 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 Cool. You definitely could. So, um, on that, uh, what are let's talk about some of the lenses that you would do this with? Because I, I think there's a lot of lenses where this is really, really worthwhile, but there's yeah. also lots and lots of lenses where this is <laughs> gonna be a bit of a huge disappointment. Yeah, that's that's I that is a lot of truth to that. <laughs> um, not everything ends up being super interesting. Um, 
uh, I think the top of the list for me is a lot of the old Kodak folding camera lenses, which are really easy to adapt. But for the most part, they're not super interesting uh, because by the time you get them adapted onto um, a digital camera specifically, you're, you're, you're at, you end up with a lens that's like somewhere between 135 and 200 millimeters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you end up with basically um, a kind of mediocre telephoto lens. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, which, you know, it's interesting, but it's interesting to a point, I guess. Um, so I tend to skip the longer uh, folding lenses. So the, a good way to think about it is the larger the format of the film that the camera you're adapting from, um, probably the longer focal length wise the lens is going to be. So if you yes. picked up an old Kodak 3A camera, which has a really nice lens on it, but I mean the you know the register distance on that thing's about a foot. So that lens is going to be like a big time telephoto converted on any smaller format 35 millimeter or smaller camera. So not probably going to be super satisfying. Um, what does work really well is if you you know any folding camera you can find that's like 127 format film mm. um will typically work because those lenses are about 75 80 millimeter which right. you know so you can you can adapt a fairly decent turn that into a fairly decent uh kind of portrait focal length lens um so that works really well and then folding cameras uh like 35 millimeter folding cameras tend to be ideal because they have yeah. Yeah, because they tend to have uh, 45 or 50 millimeter lenses on them. Yes. Um, yeah, so basically with those, you can get a very nice normal focal length lens um, that's equivalent essentially to 35 millimeter full frame. So in front of me, I mentioned one, uh, which is the, um, the lens off the Kodak uh, Bantam Special, which mm -hmm. is... Uh, it, it's a 45 millimeter F2 biotar essentially because it's nectar. Yeah. So it's a, it's a biotar. So that's an excellent lens. Another one that I have in front of me that I mentioned is I have off the uh, Foth Derby, which is also a uh, folding camera. I have the 50 millimeter F2.5 Anastigmat. Uh, so it's a nice uncoated uh, oh, yeah. lens with a lot of character um, that actually was a, you know, these cameras were considered uh, like a competitors when they were when they were out back in the day. So um, it's a really nice lens. So you, there's a lot of gems out there. Uh, a lot of the um, cameras from uh, just post Second World War, a lot of the East German cameras. You, you, it's a really good way to get a 50 millimeter uh, triaplan if you want to mm -hmm. mess around with one of those, which I've adapted that lens as well from uh, like the Balda cameras. Yes. Um, yeah, so those are really good. So really, I mean, I, to me, the, the sweet spot is a 35 millimeter folding camera will probably give you the most interesting lenses um, to do this sort of thing. If you want to shoot something that's more of a normal focal length. Yeah, but just to echo all of that you just said, um, it. I, I've tried uh, a bunch of the longer lenses. And for example, I have this old like 1918 or 1917 um i think it's an aerial reconnaissance lens but a pretty small okay. one yeah and it the the focal length must be something like 150 millimeters from what i've yeah. tried just messing around with it and it really doesn't look particularly interesting but i have sort of held it up to see the size of the image circle yeah. and it 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 covers four by five um, so I'm thinking this is a much better candidate to adapt to a Pentax 6.7 using this method. Yeah. I, I shoot in large, I'm not shooting in large format. <laughs> right, right. It, yeah, and I've been down that road too. I have some really old um, Tessars, like 4x5 mm -hmm. Tessars. And I actually had uh, mounts made for them, like machined. Um, and they work. It's just they're totally uninteresting on a smaller format camera. <laughs> right. So you would really need to put them on a larger, you know, I'm talking about barrel lenses. They really need to, they're great on medium format. They're awesome on medium format. Um, yeah. But not as interesting on smaller, you know, 35 millimeter or smaller. Exactly. The, the ones in the sort of 75 millimeter range, 
Um, a lot of six by six folders will have uh, 75 millimeter lenses on them. Yeah. Um, so those can, I haven't found many that have a particularly interesting character because mo most tend to be Tessars um, yeah. or variants thereof. And I've also done this with the taking lens of a dead TLR. Oh, uh, yeah, that those, works too. Yeah, one of those um, Siegel TLRs. So there's no aperture in it. And you can't really do it with the, uh, sorry, I, I did it with the viewing lens, not the taking yeah, lens. Yeah, the viewing lens, um, right. The, the taking lens would be hugely impractical. <laughs> Because in the TLR, you know, you've got the assembly before and after the actual body. So right. that worked pretty well. Those are those are optically, um, it, it was a lot better than I thought. It, it outperformed my uh, 6x6 Tessar um, from a dead Super Iconta that I, that I ripped off. But yeah, as far as 35 millimeter lenses go, I, I think, could you do this with a dead Vitessa with a 50 F2 Ultron on it? I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah, as long as I, you could get that lens off, sure you could. Yeah, that seems like a great candidate. Yeah. Um, because that I, I, lens is spectacular. Yeah, I haven't ever tried removing one of those, but I'm pretty sure it's a straightforward operation uh, through the back of the camera. I think they I think they have a retaining ring, and they come Yeah, right it off. looks like it. Yeah, so it, the, 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 the difficulty with like retina-style cameras um, are lenses that have... Um, a more complex shutter mechanism that's kind of yeah. built that's partly so <laughs> the difficulty with those is that the shutter mechanism is it's hard to i'm trying to think about how to visualize this but it's it's more integral to the lens and the shutter are more integral to the camera is what i'm trying mm -hmm. to say so in other words they're the, it's not easily removed and you can't really separate the lens from the shutter so yeah lenses like that are a little more of a challenge because you have to basically take the lens and shutter assembly off the camera and they don't always want to come off very easily. Mm -hmm. So retinas are, retinas are not typically the best candidate, but it can be done. Um, and I think the Vintessa would be another example of that, but I think that would come off a bit easier. So and I'm going to have to, if there's a shutter, that. if it's like a synchro comper, uh, shutter lens you, you also typically have to find a way to force the shutter open because it's right. inside the lens yeah um, so you'll have the aperture control which is fine and I, I know of maybe three to four different ways to get the shutter blades out of the way um, there's the method where you literally just take the lens apart and remove the shutter leaves uh, yeah. which is not for the faint of heart but it's not as difficult as it might look um, you just have to very very carefully document uh, the order in which the pieces yeah. come off and put them back in exactly the same order. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, the other method I've used, um, I have a lens from an old uh, French Lumiere folding camera that is completely dead. Uh, the camera is completely dead, but the lens is just something that I wanted to try. Um, so what I did with that one was I opened it up and inside there's a little spring that, um, you know, closes the shutter. Yeah. And, it, it, that one was a very, very simple shutter mechanism. It was really, really... Uh, is nothing anywhere near as complicated as a synchro comper. Mm -hmm. uh, so all I did was remove that spring. And once I removed that spring, the shutter just... The shutter blades just push out of the way and they stay out of the way. Yeah. Because the spring is what pulls them back closed. Uh, or, um, if you want, you can also just caulk the shutter, uh, put it on bulb, and right. fire the shutter, and then find a way to keep it fired so on my retina helagon uh the person who's modified this has used a thick piece of metal wire um to basically hold down the shutter button um it, it's yeah. it's really really well done I, I don't really know how they pulled this off but it, it works really well or you can just kind of find a way to press the shutter down permanently i've done it with tape i've done it with blue tack um there's all kinds of sort of diy hack it yourself methods yeah. for doing it yeah yeah. Yeah. There's the, yeah. And I've, I've done versions of that as well, where you just, you basically just find a way to jam the shutter open. Um, and you're off to the races. Sweet. Yeah. Um, so are there any other lenses that, uh, you've particularly enjoyed doing this with? Um, 
Well, actually, I mean, I have done done. I have used very old Retina cameras. The older ones, the lenses come off more easily. Uh-huh. And there's a there's a very nice uh, fifty millimeter three point five uh, Ektar lens, um, w- which those are they're really nice. Uh, so those are those are a good possibility. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think the Foth Derby one that I talked about was a little, was one of the m- slightly more complicated builds that I had to make because, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's a, it's a lens with a focusing mount, just like a, um, a Leica. So it's got, yes. you know, it's got a focusing tab. It's got a stop pin, um, at the end for, you know, close focus and infinity. So I had to find a way to get that onto the body cap, which essentially, I did that by drilling three pilot holes and I used the, the, the screws from the lens mount itself into the retaining, into the body cap piece that I made. So it was oh, a little cool. more, yeah, it's a little more complicated, but it really, it works really nicely. Um, so that was a little more challenging build, but it, it came out, you know, kind of elegant looking, uh, which, I, which I was pleased with. Um, and the other one that I mentioned, of course, is the, uh, ultra wide and slim adaptation yeah. because I got to actually take an ultra wide and slim and just drill the lens out of it, <laughs> which was kind of fun. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the ultra wide and slim gave its, gave its life to be used, uh, in a different way. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and it, it's it always helps. Um, this is where you can really nerd out and familiarize yourself with different variants as well. Yeah. Um, because right. a lot of these old folding cameras came in different flavors with uh, different lenses on them, right? Like the, the Agfa Carrots, you know, the lenses range from very vanilla to extremely nice. Yeah. Um, so if you, you know, for example, come across one with either a Heligon or a Soligon, uh, that's dead. That's a, that's a yeah, good candidate. That would, that would definitely be a good candidate. Yeah, I think you could probably do it with like the old Ansco regions regions as well. Um, those are just rebadged Agfas, right? Uh, yeah, basically. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I, I mean, I think about doing this most with uh, with some of the old Voilanders because the, some of the lenses on those are just really, really gorgeous. And yeah. It's and I'm not too hard to come by. Yeah, and I'm looking at a Vitessa right now. Hmm. Uh, I'm looking at a picture of one on eBay and it's just, I'm looking at how it's attached to the camera body uh-huh. and it's exactly how we've talked about. Essentially the camera has a lens board, right? And it has a, it has a retaining ring on the back. So if you loosen up that retaining ring and I'm just looking at the front shutter mechanism, that lens is going to just come right out. Um, now you're going to have a shutter assembly on the front, which you would probably need to do a little bit of, work to get that off the body i'm thinking because i I just i'm seeing where the shutter linkage is happening right right. yeah but it should be totally doable i think it's a very worthy would be a very worthy experiment (laughs) sweet um yeah and, and then you in particular have done this with um with vest pockets a lot right yeah right so i've done it a lot with the kodak um vest pocket the vpk which is uh you know they famously called it the soldier's camera because it was uh dates from uh world war one era and the story goes that lots of soldiers took these with them uh off to war you know primarily u.s soldiers going to to europe um so uh, they date from that era and that it's a very simple camera um, they're very frequently completely dead except for the lens. Like the bellows are all rotted away. Um, so the, but the lenses on these tend to be, it's kind of amazing. Um, they're in these really simple ball bearing shutters uh-huh. and it's, I, it's just amazing that the shutters almost always are perfectly functional despite the fact that the lens is over a hundred years old. Um, so yeah, I've is done because of how simple the mechanism is. Because it's so simple, yeah. Yeah, and I've had them apart, you know, to like every once in a while I've had one that needs a little bit of like cleaning or something, but it's such a simple but robust mechanism uh, right. that they they just tend to help, hold up really well. But anyway, very easy to adapt, and it's an interesting lens because um, 
they have a little mask in front of the lens um, to essentially throttle down the aperture opening to about f eight and a half. Uh, because what happens is without that mask in place, there's tons of uh, spherical aberration. So you get uh -huh. a very glowy look to the lens without the, with the mask not in place. So basically if you take that mask out, you're talking about a lens that's more like probably 5.6 or somewhere in that neighborhood. Wow. And yeah. And it gets very, very glowy. So if, um, if people are familiar with the, uh, school of, uh, photography, the pictorialist school, which are basically these really kind of gauzy, um, dreamy looking photos that um it was from the era when photography was really trying to somewhat emulate painting uh -huh. so they're they're these kind of very tend to be these very uh misty looking photos um I, it, it was sort of the type of photography that ansel adams and all those folks were reacting against for the most part uh -huh. um because they felt that photography was its own art right it didn't need to look like painting but it was a huge movement in photography around the turn of the century. Um, and it was very particular in Japan and in Japan in particular, these vest pocket Kodak cameras, um, they were very popular because if you took that mask out of the, of the lens, you could get the pictorial type of image with a simple commercially made, you know, camera. Um, and so codecs were, they were the first kind of mass produced cameras. So people figured that out and then they could, they could, uh, very easily without any special equipment, make those pictorial style images. So it's an interesting lens with a very interesting background in a lot of ways. Um, and super easy to adapt. It was the first, the first type of lens that I ever adapted. Um, and yeah, the results can be really nice. Yeah. They give a really sort of abstract dreamy kind of look. Yeah. Yeah, they but really do. Not as obnoxious as the Leica fan bar and definitely nowhere near no. as expensive. No, it, yeah, right, right, right. Um, <laughs> you yeah. should just start marketing them as the fan bar killer. Well, and it's funny you say that because there are examples going back uh, even to that era of these lenses being adapted to Leicas for the same reason. So it's not unheard of that people did this sort of thing. Um with these lenses even back in the day uh, because it was a particular look that, that people did want at times. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's ridiculous. You know, the, the thing I love the most about these um, vest pocket conversions as well is when you look at the lens, it looks so funky because they all have the little like thing that sticks up on top um, yeah. that almost looks like jewelry. Yeah. So you've got like this modern digital camera on the back and then you look at it from the front and it looks like it's this ancient artifact, you know. Yeah. Right, right. It's it's a pretty it's a pretty funny uh funny look. Um very really charming about uh <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Um yeah, it works. It's 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 really pretty cool. The the kind of lens that I um see the most adapted this way here in Hong Kong are uh cinema lenses. Yeah, oh, sure. It is extremely popular. Um, and, you know, those lenses, they make me drool. But uh, you will very frequently see... Uh, I'm just pulling up a shop right now that specializes in these things. And they've got, like, a woolen sack 2-inch uh, f1.5 Raptor, um, Zeissiena 6-centimeter Tessar, Cook Speed Pancros, um, stuff like that, you know. And and so this can be one of the a, a lot of the times when you see these old cinema lenses, yeah. they they can sometimes be housed in like really, really expensive conversions. Um, but if you happen to stumble upon a real bargain, which is just the, the optical block of the lens itself, and you just want to use it on digital, then this is yeah. going to be by far your best bang for the buck um, in terms of adapting those crazy old cinema lenses, too. Yeah. Yeah, that's that definitely works. Like, I I really want to see. Um, I think you know I've been lusting after a, a woolen sack Fastax Raptor, uh, fifty millimeter f two for a really long time. Yeah, and I've always wanted one converted to M mount, but I think realistically I'm probably gonna just shoot that thing on digital. So it yeah. would make a lot more sense and probably cost half as much to just find the original lens, like the optical 
chunk of the lens and then just find a way to get it onto a helicoid instead of looking for a Leica M conversion. Yeah, if you can find one. I mean, I, and that's what I did with, I, I have those Fastex lenses um, and I, I, the, I've put them on, I've mounted them on Fuji's and uh, I mean, it's, I don't know. To me, the 35 millimeter is an amazing lens. And oh, I, yeah, and, they're so nice. Yeah. And so when I, when I put it on the Fuji, it really made me want to have it adapted to uh, like amount to be, you know, range finder coupled to use on a uh, 35 because it's, it's an amazing lens. And I mean, I've, I've, you know, it's on my list for something to do someday. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would love to get it converted and be able to shoot it that way well because, there's uh, one you know here i'm just looking at, at here in hong kong um there's a lot of these listed holy crap there is uh you know the ones that have been converted to m mount already uh, are well over they're like 1200 dollars plus for the most part okay um whereas just the lens on its own um they are listed for a couple hundred bucks um, yeah, which I, is a huge difference in price. And yeah. then there's a 35 millimeter one for around $300. Okay. Which seems like a good deal. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got mine super cheap at a um, uh, camera show. So I paid very little for all the ones I have. Um, uh, yeah. But it's, yeah, I would love to get one of those converted at some point and yeah i would highly recommend it if you just want to put it on digital i would i would pick up pick one up um because they're not at all impossible to adapt uh they're a little funky because the retaining ring is very thin yeah Um, i'm seeing that right now yeah and it's it is it is a little difficult to get them off the cameras if they're on the cameras well no i shouldn't say that because they're 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 interchangeable they just screw on but um they're a little bit difficult to adapt because they sit very close to the uh you know the film plane so it, mirrorless cameras a must and even then they're a little bit difficult because you have to get there is a sort of a back part on the lens that really needs to come off before you can adapt them well i shouldn't say that people have adapted it with that silver part on the can on the lens, but it's, I find it to be easier taking that off. Is, is that silver part, um, an original mount of some kind? Yeah. That's basically the mount The so you're, you're removing part of the mount to uh-huh. adapt the lens. So that's not like an RAPL mount. That's just its own thing. Like a military mount. Uh, yeah. It's a mount specific to the fast ax camera. Oh yeah, it's not we, unlike a PL mount. It's similar. Um, okay, it's a similar kind. That's why they look similar. Um, but yeah, I mean the Fastex cameras were so we're talking about the Fastex Raptors, which were, were for yeah. a cinema camera called a sixteen millimeter called the Fastex, uh-huh. and they were basically used primarily for military stuff to shoot at extremely high speed yeah because so, they're like, like big they have this giant reel in them right the lens yeah is tiny on them yeah, yeah. yeah i've seen one of those they're, so they're they crazy. shoot at like an insane frame rate that was meant for things like you know to 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 make movies of uh moving parts and that sort of thing to be able to check function and all that kind of stuff and you could you know pictures of bullets leaving the gun kind of stuff oh right? no way yeah yeah, because they shoot at some kind of crazy frame rate. So, does do you know the the thirty five that you have? Do you know if that one covers um, full frame? Yeah, I've seen pictures of it. Yeah, that it does. Oh man! Yeah, that, I mean, I know the fifty definitely does. Yeah, um, the thirty five it can because I've seen it adapted that way, and I mean it's it's like insanely sharp in the middle. It's so nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's really <gasps> swirly, very swirly. Yeah. Very, very swirly. But these lenses have such a unique rendering to them. Right. Um, and the, the coatings are amazing. So the colors are really good. Yes. The colors are fantastic. Yeah. 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 So that's, yeah, that's why I, I, 
would love to at some point get mine adapted. So I think the the cinema lenses that I want to adapt the most are these and and the series two Cook Speed Pancros. But the okay the Speed Pancro the thirty five millimeter won't cover full frame. Um, okay. you guys it, it'll cover APS-C, and then the fifty will cover full frame. But yeah, the Wool Insect does seem like it has a larger image circle. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah, so do, do you have yours rigged up um, rigged up to work on your Fuji? Um, I did. I think I took it apart because I got a second one and I was working on trying to improve the adaptation a little bit. So I mm-hmm. don't think it's currently mounted up to work on Fuji. Um, but I have, you know, I have photos that I've shot with it on the Fuji. And it to me, it was just kind of a mind blowing <laughs> uh lens in terms of the look i mean yeah. just com- completely unique yeah right and it's a 35 millimeter which is cool so mm-hmm. yeah and the lenses themselves look really cool because they're like this military oh yeah gray. they're and very there's... military industrial looking yeah super <laughs> distinctive there's like no other lens that that quite looks like this yeah 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 for what sure. what are the focus ring um, markings? Because uh, I've seen a couple of these in person, and I remember thinking that the focus ring was marked in like very very strange increments. Uh, hold on a second, let me grab one. And I'll tell you. Okay. Well, you see, Perry, this is why I never put things away because if I put them away, <laughs> then I won't be able to find them. And I had these on my desk until like. I don't know, two weeks ago, and I cleaned off my desk, and now I have no idea where I put them. So, I know where it's. Yeah, but I did find, like, I, I literally just found my, like, three uh, organizer trays full of adapted lenses. I have, like, probably 30 lenses here that have all been adapted to helicoids. Woo! So, all off of uh, older folding cameras, cine cameras, that sort of thing. Good lord, you have a secret stash of us of this uh, stuff. Oh yeah, I got I have loads of them. I got loads and loads and loads of them. I uh, so I think the fast axe, I mean if I'm not mistaken, um it's probably just calibrated for uh very fine focus, I'm guessing. Um because that makes they sense. were yeah, they were meant for they were often used for like very close up kind of work. Mhm. Yeah. Yeah, and they're they're going to be like sort of Pull focused um, on a cinema yeah. rig, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. Anyway, let's let's stop talking about these lenses. I don't want to drive the price up before okay. before I can get yeah, before I can sure get my hands get, on one. Yeah, right, right, right. they've already started to go a little nuts. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm sure, um, I'm sure they have. Yeah. So I I think I think that I mean I think we've covered helicoids unless there's anything from this tray you've just dug up that you think is particularly cool and worth highlighting. You know, that's funny you say that because I was just going to look through because I haven't, you know, it's been a while since I've messed around with these. I've done so many of them. Um, yeah, let's see. I've got a, in this tray, I've got a nice Foth lens. It's a 50 millimeter 3.5. Um, oh yeah. Here's the, uh, um, I have a Zenar, a, a, 2.8 cm so it, uh uh f2.8 4.5 centimeter right so it's a 45 millimeter 2.8 um zenar which is a mm-hmm. nice li- nice little lens i have from uh this lens i have an opton tessar 75 millimeter 3.5 t red t which came off of it must have originally been on um a zeiss folder Yes, um, I yeah, think I have the same lens uh, adapted to a helicoid that I took off an Iconta. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. That's probably what this came off of as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. And then I got a whole bunch of Kodak lenses in here. And then let's see what's in this one. Uh, this spin has the Triaplan. So um, what, what what camera did you get a Triaplan off? I uh, came off of... Uh, one of the Balda uh, folders, okay. so it's a it's a fifty millimeter two point nine. Um, okay, and I have it mounted up in a body cap with a little hood on it, um, and it it is very uh, it has a lot of veiling flare, so it really needs to be used um, with a hood on the front. I found, uh-huh. uh, but a nice a nice lens. Oh, this is interesting. I've got a very small. Uh, 
45 millimeter 2.8 Opton Tessar. I'm not even sure what this came off of, but it's really small. Yeah, it's really small, really nice. And then I have um, the one I mentioned. Oh, no, this is different. Um, it's This is the one from uh, the Retina that I rigged up. It's actually a Zenar. It's a uh, 50 millimeter 3.5 Zenar um, on a body cap. So, yeah, that's one of my favorites. Yeah, I got – oh, my God, I have just loads of these things. I have just loads and loads of them. That's that's and, and now you, you never knew you never use them now because you have to use them on digital. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I could rig them up to work on film, um, uh-huh. which I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to throw one of these on my uh, Petri Penta, or heck, I could even probably throw one on the Minolta. Um, yeah, I mean, some of these will definitely mount to film SLRs, but the register distance is a little bit. You know, you're working yeah. around that, so it's a little tricky. Yeah, you got to find one where the original folding distance is um, a little bit longer. Exactly. If it's exactly. 35 millimeter, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. So that's kind of the trick on, on all this stuff. Um, uh, but I mean, you know, how hard is it to test this out? Not hard at all. Um, let's see. I mean, I could just grab uh, you know a camera off the shelf, an M42 camera. And screw this one of these in and see. Let me just see how close it is um, right from the get go. <laughs> we are live adapting as we Yeah, speak. live adapting. So I'm just screwing one of these Putting lenses to in practice. to see if it to see. Uh... Oh, this is funny. So the camera I grabbed is a Contax D SLR. So an ancient. <laughs> it's, it's totally friggin' ancient. Uh, let's open this up wide open. And see if we get anything resembling infinity focus. Um, this is without a helicoid. I'm just kind of like spitballing it here. And no, it's definitely not reaching infinity. So it would need to be on a different camera body. It might reach on a Minolta because they have a little bit shorter uh, distance. But hey, awesome macro. <laughs> does macro really well would almost do eh, it doesn't quite do portrait distance but anyway um yeah there's there's loads of options for putting these on film cameras as well you just got to get something that sits just far enough away right oh man i'm looking i'm looking on ebay right now and there's only one um balda vest pocket camera with a tria plan on it yeah um but that is uh, that is not in good shape, even though the price is okay. Yeah, those are those are really great for for adapting. <coughs> I mean, the lenses just come right out, so super easy. Awesome. All right. Uh, I think I think I think we've done it. We've done our helicoid special. All right. And we didn't leave loads of stuff for Simon to edit. <laughs> Hopefully not. Hopefully yeah. it'd be a, it'd be an easy day for him when he's you know back up and running. All right, is there uh, is there anything else that we need to add or anything you, else you want to sort of chuck in on on this discussion? Uh, no, other than I would say obviously we're talking about things that are easier visualized if you see photos, and I yes. do have I do have some photos um, related to doing this, which maybe what I'll do is drop those into uh, the when we post this on Facebook, I'm going to drop those photos into the discussion on classic lenses podcast. So Mm. if you, if you want to participate, I'm going to, that's where I'm going to put them. Um, So yeah, check, check it out there in the discussion. And then we can kind of continue the conversation uh, on this there after the podcast goes live. Yeah, and um, to anyone who's listening, if anyone out there uh, is in our Classic Lenses podcast Facebook group and wants to try this and owns a GFX, uh, I really want to see people doing this on the GFX more. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. yeah, that's super doable, too. I mean, Oh, totally. Yeah, I would love to have one of those just for adapting. <laughs> oh, man, that would be crazy. Uh, right. Do we do we have a... 
is is there an email we need to read maybe uh, or do we have to do that or um hold on let me pull it up I thought there's there's one here there's that I one think we email. were gonna read. Yeah. Oh, it's a short one from Jeremy North. Yeah, yeah I got it here. You want to do that? And uh, it, it, it was rumor has it it's his birthday. Is no, this, it's Nigel Cliff's true? birthday. Nigel Cliff's birthday. Okay, that's what we're I'm gonna wish him. Happy birthday, happy Nigel Cliff. Cliff. Happy birthday, Nigel. We only know this because Simon told us, but happy birthday all the same. Yeah, exactly. So Jeremy North sends an email on uh, Thursday, February 27th. Subject is Canon FD. And he says, hello again, chaps. Here's a question about Canon FD lenses. Well, the 50 millimeter 1.4 is to be precise. I have two different versions. One is an SSC breech lock and the later one, which has no coding suffix and is not a breech lock, but a straightforward bayonet fit. Uh, are they the same optically or is one better than the other? If so, why I'm thinking of selling the Canon F one. So your answer may swing me one way or the other. Oh my God. A Canon F one is in the balance. Uh, <laughs> thanks always Jay. Well, hmm. my que- my first question was, is it the new F one or the old F one? Cause if it's the new F one, just sell it. <laughs> If it's the uh, old F1, you got to keep that thing. That's such a nice camera. Uh, no, I mean, okay, so my understanding is that, well, the last lenses in the line in the, let's call it the um, uh, breech lock version of the FD mount uh, are the SSC coded lenses. And yeah. right, so my understanding is that the non breech lock lenses that came afterwards. Uh, the new, like they call them the new FD lenses are essentially the same coding wise as the SSC lenses. Oh, that, really? Yeah. That's my understanding. I don't know. They may have tweaked them further than that. Um, oh, cause with the 51.4s, I've always just thought SSC equals better. No SSC equals worse, but I really do not know much about FD lenses. Well, I don't like them. I only mean because the the new FD lenses came after, like the breech lock yeah. SSC lenses. So I'm assuming they carried over the same lens coatings to those lenses, right? right? I mean they 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 look relatively the same. Um, so I don't know. I personally prefer the SSC lenses. Um, mm-hmm. I know the breech lock, breech lock is kind of a pain, but the, to me the lenses are just they're made so much better. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the later F, the newer FD lenses to me feel really plasticky. Right. Uh, yeah. So I so just for um, handling and feel, I prefer the SSC breech lock versions personally. But that's you know personal prejudice. Doesn't yeah. mean that and, and, you know they're all they're all decent. They're at fifty one point fours. Yeah. I think my brother has the early non SSC. Uh, but like the the early one, not the new FD one, and yeah, it performs like perfectly fine, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly, exactly. Um, uh, yeah, so I mean, sure, th- that to me, those are those are really they're really decent lenses. Um, yeah, and I don't know, like the actually one of the nice nicer lenses I think out there in fifties are the fifty one two SSCs. Some of those are just oh yeah, really gorgeous lenses. Yeah, yeah, surprisingly good. Yeah, they're really, really nice, and they're nicely made too. Like some, like the SSC versions in particular, mm-hmm. um, and it, some of them are really not very common. There's a chrome nose version of the SSC fifty one point two, which is relatively uncommon. So, um, if you want to pick one of those up and you want a special one, look for the chrome nose. Nice. Yeah, the the eighty five one point two is also. Oh yeah. Nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's mm-hmm. a beautiful lens. So yeah, all right. Um, Thanks for the email, Jeremy North. Cool. Let us know if you sell your Canon F1 or not. Yes. Yeah, be sure to let us know what happens. All right. Uh, um, yeah. Any uh, Simon has a couple of shout-outs, um, which I, I he has sent through, and I guess we'll uh, read out. We've already done one of them, which is to Nigel Cliff. So once again, a very happy birthday to you, Nigel. Um, he's just told us that his daughter is saving for a sony a7 um, oh yeah 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 <laughs> so he's been a positive influence uh yeah. in his family right yeah definitely 
That's great. And the other thing um, that Simon has sent through is that next week, apparently, uh, we will have not one but two guests. Uh, so hopefully Simon's internet is back by then because we will be joined by Hamish Gill and uh, Nate Johnson. Yeah. Hamish Gill of 35MMC fame and uh, Nate Johnson from Negative Lab Pro. Uh, and they will be speaking with us about digitizing. Yeah, film, which is a big topic. Yeah, uh, Hamish is going to talk about his uh, what's it called? The um, Pixelator. Pixelator. Making yes. this in the notes. P I X. Yeah, Pixelator. And hopefully so, that means and, it is close to hitting the market. Yeah, yeah. Which would be really interesting because you know if everyone has destroyed their film, nobody will need a Pixelator. <laughs> Just one of the questions that might come up next week for Hamish. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so, um, apart from that, uh, do you have any shout outs, Johnny? I actually have a, a little list of them. Yeah, I feel like I saw everybody uh, this oh, week. Nice. Uh, I saw uh, the Trempers. I saw them on Saturday. Uh, I saw everybody on Saturday. I saw the Trempers on Saturday. Um, and you might. Uh, take a look you'll see jared i think posted that he's doing a project called 40 days of film i think he gave up uh digital for lent so uh-huh. yeah so he so jared's doing 40 days of film uh so jump in on that conversation i know that Wait, he, isn't he, the concept behind lent that you give up something desirable I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, ouch. Ouch. <laughs> oh, yeah. Jared, yeah. Jared's a, Jared's a proud Sony guy, and that's good. We we like that. Um, yeah. Uh, and then also the maze stopped in, so I saw the maze. Uh, and I also saw Bob Matter on Saturday. So I saw, it's like I saw everybody on Saturday. Um, saw uh, Hong Jun Lee this week a few times. We had a, a few conversations about things. He's He's back safely from South Korea with no coronavirus. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, and I want to give out to, to, to Mike Panovac. Ah, because, yes. Because, because Mike has been doing some crop point and shoot camera photography. And of course, if Mike Novak is doing a panorama, it's a Panovac. <laughs> <laughs> so so keep up the good work mike and he's um, doing it on a pentax point and shoot right that's so, right yes on theme very good yeah on on theme on theme yeah and i believe uh hamish just did a released a 35 mmc where he talks about uh camera we were talking about last week i think i mentioned he's talking about shooting uh crop panorama on the uh, Pentax uh, ZX5 or Ooh. the M, what is it, the MZ5? It's got a couple different names. Same camera with many names. He's had but, a lot of Pentax love on his site recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think he's he's got uh, yes. That time I shot an 18 to 55 millimeter APS-C digital lens on a 35 millimeter Pentax film camera. So he's put that lens on his MZ5 in crop panorama mode. Um, oh, nice. and yeah, yeah, it looks good. So, uh, go check out the results there. That should be, that should be fun. Cool. Look, it looks, looks pretty damn good for a, uh, cheapo kit lens. Is that, uh, awesome. Is that, is that it for your shout outs? Um, yeah, I think that's everybody that I can remember at least. Okay. Um, I have, uh, two shout outs. I'm going to start sounding like a broken record with these. Um, but the first shout out is uh, to my girlfriend, who again we spent. Oh, we've had just fantastic light for the last couple of weeks in Hong Kong. It, it was gloomy today, but um, we went out shooting again over the weekend, and you know those long four o'clock shadows are just really hitting oh, the spot these yeah. days. That's great. So yeah, so we had a great time shooting. Uh, she was using the Hexar and thirty five Simicron, of course. Um, and I was shooting the Ricoh GR, and there was one point where we traded cameras halfway through because um, I don't know if she would like me saying this, but let's just say she had the shutter speed dial on a shutter speed other than AEL uh, for a couple of frames before I pointed it out, and she was a little annoyed at that point. So, <laughs> so we traded cameras, she <laughs> took point and shoot. 
Um, and that was fun. And my other shout out uh, goes to a quick one to Mike Epstein because I bumped into him the other day. Um, we weren't actually hanging out, but we were. Uh, I was out, and then he was out, and we bumped into each other uh, in front of an American supermarket. He was with a, a friend who was doing some shopping there. And this American supermarket is called AM, and they basically sell things that only the uh, American population here in Hong Kong want to buy. Like, for example, um, the largest jars of mustard you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> and just gigantic bulk purchases of, of ridiculous things. You know how in America, you guys in your supermarkets, in, in Costco and stuff, you have like, you know, boxes of cereal that are like freaking enormous. Yeah. Right. And you save some money by buying in bulk dog food that comes in like 30 kilo bags. Um, yeah. Oh, for so, sure. Yeah, there's only like one of these in Hong Kong and it's a very ridiculous place. So I bumped into him in front of that. Um, but he was he was out shooting with a very strange combo. Uh, he had a Pentax fisheye lens um, mount. I think a 17 millimeter K-mount fisheye lens uh, mounted to his Leica M240. Mm. Um, shooting digital. It's the one with the built-in filters. You know that one with the little ring at the front, and then oh, there's yeah. like a yeah, there's like a built-in yellow filter and a built-in orange filter that um, oh. sort of sits in front of the aperture blades. Yeah, yeah. So he was shooting that on an M240, which which is kind of counterintuitive to me, but uh, I guess that's the only full-frame digital camera that he has, and and the results actually look pretty cool. So it's just, nice. I, I always forget that you can use the like a m240 for just regular adapting because <laughs> it, it's register distance is not obnoxiously long but yeah it's just such a bad camera for doing that that it's like uh sony's better yeah right right but that's cool that yeah i've never um that's not true i've seen like long lenses with built-in filters but i think that's the first fisheye lens i've seen with a with built-in color filters which is super cool because you don't have to carry them yeah right yeah uh yeah so i think that is that's it for my shout outs um okay you have to do the whole yeah i gotta do the whole thing now um uh so <laughs> <laughs> so what how can you uh connect with the podcast how, how all about the podcast um you can send us an email at classic lenses podcast at gmail.com we will read those emails here on the podcast. So do that. Uh, you can, of course, check out the podcast. It's uh, podcast itself at classiclensespodcast.com. Um, that's where we post each episode. That's where you can get the complete show notes uh, and everything there. Um, you can follow along the conversation uh, on the Facebook group for uh, Classic Lenses Podcast, uh, where we will have a conversation this week, hopefully, about uh, adapting and so forth. Um, you can follow us on Instagram or not us, but you can follow, uh, best vintage lens on Instagram. They're our Instagram partner and they have amazing photos every day posted on their Instagram made with, uh, classic lenses. So be sure to check that out. Um, I think Ricardo just dropped a new, um, show notes for the last that episode. That is correct. A new review. Yeah. Yeah. So make sure to check that out as well. Um, and tag your images with best vintage lens. If you want to get featured on best vintage lens on Instagram. Um, if you want to, uh, watch the <laughs> subtitles for the podcast, you can do that on, in, on, uh, YouTube. So just look for best vintage lens on YouTube. And that way you can find the podcast with subtitles, which I'm assuming are, somewhat close to what we say maybe maybe not <laughs> Bart nugget Let's see what they do with that i'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna quickly check while you're wrapping this up on on um how many i've never looked there? i mean i just i i've never looked either i've never looked i'm just assuming that they the i'm just assuming that the captions are probably oddly hilarious in spots which would be great which all would right be so <laughs> um Jason Lane's uh, episode 100 has 754 views. Really? Holy yeah. crap. Uh, the video of, hold on, let me actually click on the Classic Lenses podcast channel. Yeah. Um, your Snow is Falling on Central Camera has 84 views. 
Uh, Mike Gutterman <laughs> drinking Malort has 156. Okay. Um, Mike Epstein running across the horizon has 179. And then okay. last week's episode, uh, Ride with Mystery, Animal Mystery, that has uh, two views. <laughs> okay. All right. So, you know, a uh, big following there on YouTube, as as you see. But look at that. You you Google Classic Lenses Podcast YouTube, and you get the Classic Lenses Podcast on YouTube. It just comes right up. It's amazing. I, I'm trying to imagine the profile, because I know there are some people who who do this, where they put it on their TV, and they just have it playing in the background as they do their chores at home or something. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I'm just trying to it, picture, you know, who who listens to podcasts on their TV? It just, it seems like a very strange, well, yeah. you know what? It's perfectly in the spirit of what we've talked about this week. Cause we're talking about getting lenses onto things that they don't belong on. And I think getting a podcast yeah. through YouTube via TV is a perfectly, you know, in that spirit. Yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm just reading the, <laughs> I'm just reading the captions for the last episode and it's kind of awesome. <laughs> talking about ricardo yeah this is very much worth doing people um tough shed so now that weed is legal in illinois i might just get baked and just look at our podcast on youtube just for the subtitles that are hilarious (laughs) i think it might be a worthwhile activity goodness Uh, oh that's all right anyway um uh what else do we have in the wrap-up zone um we have to thank our we're not going to read them but we'll thank all of the donors who donate to us via Kofi mm-hmm. or coffee it's ko-fi yeah uh, and just look up classic lenses yeah and you can you can make a donation to us people there um if you like to help support the podcast uh what else we have to thank that dude that does the music uh kevin mcleod McLeod. in Compatech, is that correct yeah kevin mcleod in Compatech. octo blues octo blues wasn't mcleod wasn't that a tv show in the 70s i don't know i wasn't born then oh that's right uh <laughs> mcleod tv series wikipedia yeah yeah i used to watch mcleod uh 1970 to 1977 a little before your time perry mm-hmm. a little before your time yeah he was like the um he was like this uh a cop from like the southwest so he's got this whole like burt reynolds look going on with a cowboy hat and a sheep share jacket and a big mustache and he's he's working in manhattan so it's like the country cop goes to manhattan is the whole shtick i'm gonna watch uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get baked to watch mcleod now <laughs> uh and kojak McLeod, McLeod and Kojak. And maybe maybe some Columbo while we're at it. Okay, anyway. Um, <clears throat> Kevin McLeod, thanks for the music. And uh, yeah, thanks for the music. Yeah. And then you can find us at. Uh, oh, you can... God. Yeah, we have to do all that still. Um, okay, so you can find Simon on eBay. He, As he, it's he's, Fozzie. Yeah, I was like, it's something with a Muppet. It, it, it's Fozzie. It's Fozzie. It's Fozzie. Yep. He's it, Simon Forster Photographic on Instagram. Yep. And then he has uh, a website, right? Which is, Where, I think, Simon Forster Photographic.co.uk. Yeah. And he sells uh, adapters and stuff. Yes. And 3D, 3D printed, printed lens caps. Yeah. Pick up a 3D printed Exacta rear lens cap. And I mean, you've got you've got one, right, Perry? Uh, no, I got the X-Pan one. Um, oh, the X-Pan Rick- one. That's right. You got the X-Pan lens cap. Yeah, yeah I think Ricardo's got the Exacta one. Okay. So anyway, pick up a adapter or uh, lens cap from Simon. Yes. And then Do I that. think on Twitter, he's Simon4. Four. Simon4. Four. Uh, and then you can find him in some dark room in Stoke on Tuesday. Right. The Six Towns dark room. Six towns, not six cows. Six towns. No, six towns. I always wanted to call it the six cows dark room. I don't know why. <laughs> it, fits, it fits the vibe. That's how I imagine Stoke on Trent, right? Yeah. Like farm animals everywhere. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Windy. 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, what else do we have to do in the wrap up? Um, do we have to? Me- oh, well, Perry, where can people find you? Uh, Instagram and Flickr at Perry G uh, or my never updated website, Perry G.com. Or if you're in Hong Kong, um, you can probably find me at home because I'm so bored these days, <laughs> as many of us are. Uh, oh I think a lot God. of Hong Kongers. Oh, man, dude. Hong Kongers are suffering from some serious cabin fever because loads of people have been working from home. Uh, okay. Or just not going to school and stuff like that. And the other weekend, um, all of the outdoor areas that are usually quite sparsely populated yeah. were, were just packed with people trying to get out. So the entire city, if you open Google Maps, is hilarious because the entire city was basically dead. Um, <laughs> but then in like on top of the highest mountain, yeah. there were like thousands of people who had gone up there to hike and the road was completely congested. Oh, people seriously? People driving their car up to the parking lot. Oh, yeah, so there funny. are some photos of basically... You know, people trying to escape the crowds and the coronavirus by going up on top of the mountain and then finding like the largest crowd in Hong Kong is on top of that mountain. <laughs> uh, that is funny. That is pretty funny. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, that's really funny. So, where can they find you? Uh, um, I'm not even going to talk about that Instagram place right now. They're still bothering mm-hmm. me. Uh, you can you can find come see me at Central Camera. Um, I'm I'm there every day except for Monday. Sunday we're closed. Uh, I'm here doing the podcast on Monday. I can't go to work because of the podcast. But otherwise, I'd work six days a week, right? Um, uh, yeah. Anyway, you can visit me at Central Camera Company and come on in and say hello. That would be awesome. Sweet. Yeah. Um, but it's, that's about it, I think. Right? Did yeah. we forget anything? I'm sure we I forgot something, I, but probably, but okay. yeah. sounds pretty good. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So where... there's probably some like outro music right now by the Kevin McLeod guy, not the guy on the cowboy, not the cowboy on the TV show, the other guy. Uh, so there's probably some outro music and that's going on. And then I guess we just say goodbye pretty much. Okay. <clears throat> so you want to do, you want to, you want to do the honors there, Perry? All right, this is where Simon would say, uh, hope you've enjoyed this week's show, and uh, if you can, be like Carl. Yeah.